This episode of Epicenter Bitcoin is brought to you by Hide.me. Protect yourself against hackers and safeguard your identity online with a first-class VPN. Go to Hide.me slash Epicenter and sign up for a free account today. Hi, welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and people driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with Stefan Thomas and Evan Schwartz. Stefan, many listeners will probably know because he's been on the show before. He's the CTO of Ripple and Evan is a software developer at Ripple Labs. And they are also the co-creators of the Interledger protocol. Interledger is very exciting because they're trying to tackle one of the really, really hard problems, which is interoperability when you have a hundred new projects coming up with their own blockchain and people trying to integrate that into all kinds of other systems. It just becomes a bigger and bigger problem. So we're glad that they're, they're trying to tackle that and we're excited to speak about that project today. So thanks so much for joining us, guys. Thank you. So yeah, Evan. Actually, actually, I we've been we've been sort of harassing you guys to come on for uh, I don't know how long, six months perhaps. Sorry. Uh, and <laughs> no, no, I'm excited that it's finally working out. And and I think Evan, you you also gave a talk at the meetup in Berlin about this. Yeah. And you also gave. We should also add. I think that was maybe a year before. Or, or maybe even longer than that, uh, a workshop on Codius once. So can you talk briefly just sort of where does Interledger come from and, and how does that relate to, to Codius? Yeah, so when we were working on the Codius projects, one of the project, one of the things that really came out of that was like starting to think beyond um, a blockchain and thinking, thinking beyond having one cryptocurrency that everything's sort of tied to. Um, we didn't want everyone to have to use XRP or Bitcoin or just one specific cryptocurrency to pay for our Codius contracts. And we also wanted the contracts to then be able to trigger payments without having to integrate with, you know, 10 different types of blockchains. And so it was really during that time that we started to think about interoperability and like, um, how do you make it so that the user can pay with one thing and the Codius host can accept another thing and have it still work? And then also have sort of a a standard protocol to kick off payments and to control where money is, no matter what kind of ledger you're talking about. It could be, you know, blockchain, a centralized ledger, etc. And so that's where the sort of key, uh, sort of core of interoperability came from for us. Yeah, and I'll just add that a lot of, like today, if you want to make payments, most payment systems in the world work fine as long as you want to send a payment to someone else who's on that same payment system. So if I'm in Europe and want to send a payment using SEPA, works well. If I have Bitcoin and you have Bitcoin, works well. If I have PayPal and you have PayPal, probably works well. The problem comes in if I have one of those and you have a different one and we have no match and maybe there's no way for, we, we don't want to get another account. We'd like, to, uh, when we talk about the, this, uh, this vision of the internet of value, what we see is an experience where it's much more like how the internet actually works where I have whatever money or whatever, I'm on whatever network I want and I can send money to you. So that's a lot of where the, in, the interoperability goal comes from. But, but wasn't this originally kind of also the idea of, of Ripple that you can sort of then connect into all kinds of different things and, you know, people can issue assets on Ripple and then everything kind of moves smooth, smoothly as well? Heck, it was even the idea of Bitcoin. I mean, if you think about it, that was one of the promises of Bitcoin is that you could use Bitcoin to send money anywhere around the world without you know having to use banks. And right. and, and that and Bitcoin provides a layer of interoperability. Although although Ripple, I guess, was did make the step that you say, okay, you can issue sure. like US dollar on Ripple or something like that. Yeah, this this obviously you know really speaks to me the the way that you're putting it because that has been really my journey in terms of. Um, the goal has always been the same. It's been to to make you know the movement of money as frictionless as information. Um, but that was the reason I got into Bitcoin. And and what I noticed within Bitcoin was that well, you needed support for different currencies. So I joined Ripple. And then I noticed with Ripple that um, yes, you now we have different currencies, but you still have sort of this issue that you all have to be connected to one ledger. It doesn't address uh, how to move the money from that ledger to all the other systems out there. There's never going to be one ledger that all data is stored on and all uh, you know all uh, transactions happen on. Um, and the reason is not even scalability. I think we could solve scalability with, with sharding and with, with other cool um, concepts. But um, the the problem is that there's a sort of scalability of functionality, a sort of 
um, you know, diversity in terms of the use cases where you can't have one system that really perfectly serves each use case. Is the same system that's doing micropayments going to be good for moving billions of dollars? Is the same system um, that, that's really decentralized good for someone who wants like the lowest latency possible? Probably not. So it's probably good to have some layer on top that allows a little bit of diversity in terms of the ledgers um, and still makes it possible to transact as, as, uh, without thinking about the difference of ledger and thinking about, I have to go from this network to this network. And what we've also seen is that because there's so much that goes into the design of a specific ledger and there's so many decisions that are made and often there's some there's economic interests in people using your ledger, what you end up having is someone's, let's say I come up with a ledger that's going to be the ledger for interoperability, it has all the best features, etc. So I, t I go to you and I say, here, come get on my ledger. And then, but you're, you already have the ledger that you're using and you say, no, you should get on my ledger, not the other way around. And then you're at an impasse and you end up with a very fractured system where everyone is saying, my ledger is the best one for interoperability. But you don't end up with interoperability because everyone stays in their own camps. And so what, what we saw the need for was something that could bridge that, that allows everybody to use whatever the ledger they want, and it doesn't matter. And we can still get that payment experience we're looking for. Exactly. So what's what's interesting here is that you use this term ledger is is a ledger uh, an accurate description for all these different systems that hold value because i've always kind of heard ledger in the context of blockchains right we speak about of distributed ledgers but but does it make sense to speak of ledgers when you speak about paypal and all these other systems that you want to be interoperable here so in general the term ledger just refers to Back in the really back in the day, and in some places still, uh, a ledger is just a book with accounts and balances, and it records changes to those. And ultimately, what you care about is like, yeah, I have this account. How much of the thing that I'm tracking does that one own? And you can see everything from. Uh, we use that as a kind of general term because every every one of these different cryptocurrencies, banks, PayPal, etc. Are, they all operate ledgers. Maybe it's possible that they don't think of them that as being their primary function. They may think of themselves as a payment network, for example. But underlying all of that, you have some listing of accounts and balances, and that's what we talk about when we meet when we say ledger. And and one should also add, right, that into ledger itself is actually not a ledger, right? Correct. Yeah, there's no ledger built in. It's it's purely a protocol for interoperability, or it's a protocol suite for interoperability between different ledgers. And I think also interesting to point out, and perhaps what when, when people initially think of these things, they think of a network, and, and interledger is not a network even. It's, it's, it's a protocol. At, 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 and clearly at the base layer, what a protocol is, it allows people to organize around the same way to communicate. Yeah, so there's actually a pretty close uh, analog between Interledger and the internet. That's, that's also partly why we chose the name. Um, so for example, on, on Interledger, there is a way to address different ledgers and address accounts on different ledgers, just like the internet protocol IP has IP addresses to address hosts on different networks. Um, there's also other similarities. So for example, on uh, an internet protocol suite, you have TCP and you have UDP, which are what's called transport protocols. And so they take care of um, things like retries and retransmissions, and so there's an equivalent in Interledger as well. So um, it's just a, a, a parallel in terms of internet is not a network, it is just something that ties different networks together in the minimal way possible. That's a really key point because when, so a, a lot of different cryptocurrencies uh, have, have been called at different times protocols for money, and a key thing to understand about that is that all of these cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin, Ripple, etc., have protocols that they use to communicate with one another. But the really key point is that in order for me to use the Bitcoin protocol usefully, I have to be connected to the one true Bitcoin network. There's not really any purpose for you and I to use the Bitcoin protocol with one another if we're not both talking about the exact same network, because then basically what you're talking about is a fork or an altcoin or a, you know, a different chain, and that's not, that's not Bitcoin, that's your other thing. And so while they do have protocols, in order to use them usefully with both Bitcoin and Ripple, you have to be connected to the network of specific validators, et cetera. 
Whereas with Interledger, it's really just a way for different networks to peer with one another. So there's no, there is no one Interledger in the same way that there's no real, there isn't really one internet. It's just, it's a network of telecommunications networks. And what we, we talk about it as one thing, but it's really an abstract concept that's just made up of this network of networks. Yeah, and what's interesting in the literature that you've written and the white paper is that you reference these RFCs from the late 80s that describe the internet protocol and describe, uh, yeah, IP. Um, and it's, it's really fascinating to me that, I mean, these, these, these ideas have been around for so long. And I mean, we can get into this later, but it seems to me that Interledger itself uh, the the fact that it's happening now, and of course, like you you guys are in the Bitcoin world and the ecosystem and what have you, but I mean, Interledger could have existed a long time ago, like even before Bitcoin. There's nothing that I don't think anyway that Bitcoin brought anything new to the table that made Interledger inherently possible. So it's uh, it's sort of fascinating that it's happening now, like you know, 25 years after the web was created and you know, whatever, how long after the internet was created. And it took so long to get here when all these principles have been around for, for quite some time. That's a really good observation. I uh, gave some guest lectures recently for, for some students. And uh, one thing that, that I told them is that I think the biggest contribution that, that Bitcoin has really made is that it's brought a lot of really smart people into the space of, of uh, finance where you know, a lot of them might have not even thought of themselves as financial engineers or anything like that, or, or something that, that that would be something they could ever have an impact on. And think Bitcoin gave everybody sort of this realization that, no, you can have a huge impact by working in this space and by working on these technologies. Um, and so I think that's a really powerful contribution. And I think that's why these types of efforts are happening now. It also got a lot of financial networks to say, oh, hey, we should probably look at this new technology that's coming out and what, you know, what everyone nowadays is like, what are we doing about blockchains? Uh, and that, that's also a really big thing to get existing, existing financial players to come along and say, yeah, we actually, we like that vision that you're pitching. How can we be part of it? Right. The doors are all open right now. Yeah. I think what Bitcoin may have, may have brought also is this, you know, this change in mindset and the, this idea that you can innovate without permission in, in this financial space, which is highly regulated and sort of, you know, cordoned off. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's talk about Interledger, the architecture. Uh, can you give us a description uh, of you know, what are the different layers of the architecture of the protocol? Mm -hmm. um, so we use a, a model with currently four layers um, and the four layers are the ledger layer, the interledger layer, the transport layer, and the application layer from bottom to top. Um, so the bottom layer, the ledger layer, is basically where you find the ledger protocols. This is where you find the Bitcoin protocol, the Ripple protocol, um, you know, ISO 20022, which is what a lot of banks use. So this is where you find sort of the, the nuts and bolts of, of making money movements, making transfers on individual ledgers. The next layer is the interledger layer. And on the interledger layer, what you find is um, basically, uh, the header, the information um, that is necessary to associate a transfer with what's supposed to happen on another ledger afterwards. Um, so if you see a, an interledger transfer on, on one ledger, um, a, a connector can look at that header and can look at that interledger layer data and knows what to do with that transfer going forward. Um, now, with that, you have sort of this, this graph of nodes of ledgers and connectors um, and the next thing you need to do is you need to actually send something across that um, without, without dropping the money or, or things uh, falling apart halfway. Um, and so for that, we have a, a transport layer. And so just like TCP uh, takes care of retries, uh, we have a transport protocol called a UTP, Universal Transport Protocol, um, which basically uh, takes care of retries and takes care of um, putting money in escrow such that it can't just get lost on the way. Um, and then finally, you have an application layer. And so... On the TCP IP side, on the internet side, uh, you would find the HTTP there, you'd find SMTP. So there's lots of different application layer protocols. Um, that's probably the layer where there's the most diversity. Um, and so we think with Interledger could be very similar where um, there are sort of a, um, you know, a bread and butter standard protocol, which we haven't designed yet, which is um, 
the equivalent to HTTP, but then there's lots of other ones that are for specific use cases. So for example, within Ripple, we have one called Payment Services Protocol that is proprietary, that is completely just used within Ripple. That's an application layer protocol that builds on the open ILP protocols. Let's take a short break to talk about Hi.me. You know you need a VPN provider to protect yourself against those nasty hackers trying to steal your private information. With Hi.me, it couldn't be easier. You just install their application on all your devices, iOS or Android, log in, and you have a cushiony, cozy tunnel in which your data can move freely and unencumbered, all the while protecting you from those mean old hackers. Now that's boom. To sign up for the free plan, go to hi.me slash epicenter. The best thing is when you use that URL, if you ever go premium later, you're going to get 35% off and premium comes with unlimited bandwidth using up to five devices at the same time. You can use all their servers worldwide. You can pay with Bitcoin. And best of all, it comes with a feeling of peace and satisfaction, like having tea with the Dalai Lama. We would like to thank Kite.me for their support of Epicenter Bitcoin. So talking about the, the first one, the ledger layer, uh, as sort of the, the fundamental, I guess, it, it, would it be correct to say the ledger layer is really kind of a set of requirements that different ledgers have to fulfill in order to be part of Interledger? There's a couple different different ways you can look at it. So the, the ledger layer is the as Stefan was saying, the protocols that individual ledgers use, so the Bitcoin protocol, for example. And so there, we, in, uh, we put out this architecture document, and in there, one of the things it talks about is different levels of uh, functionality that an individual ledger might use in order to support interledger best. So the absolute minimum is you have some protocol for expressing transfers from one account to another. That's like the really the, the absolute minimum and uh, having, an, a, having a way to either have a unique identifier or a memo, some kind of memo attached to that transfer uh, is, is, on, is like on the lower, lower end of functionality. So you have basic transfers from one account to another with some data attached to be able to say, this is that transfer we talked about. So would an example of this be, let's say, a SEPA payment where you have an IBAN and you know you send an amount, and then you can also send some text with the payment. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I, I, today we're kind of in that phase where, like, when you talk about SEPA as a as a ledger within to ledger, like the first thing that comes to my mind is is as fast as SEPA is and as efficient as SEPA is. Is it really that kind of um, you know ledger that could participate in an interledger transaction? And um, something that's really put that in context for me recently is like looking at some old videos when when people were first experimenting with internet protocols. And they were also using a lot of not so great networks. You know, you can kind of think of the the phone um, a receiver that you're putting onto the thing, and then it makes a noise, and then the phone receiver picks it up, right? That that sort of old school stuff. Um, and so um, that's kind of the phase that we're in right now. Yeah, you could make an interledger payment over SEPA, but we also imagine that interledger is going to put a lot of pressure on ledgers to get a lot faster, a lot more efficient. And the true interledger vision won't be realized until ledgers have uh, sort of yeah, ledgers have caught up with it essentially. Yeah, sorry, I can, I can speak a little bit more to what some of those requirements would look like. So Stefan mentioned things like speed and like latency and scalability. So that's, that's one piece of it that a lot of ledgers right now are not very scalable. And so that would sort of limit the throughput, obviously. Um, another part of it is when Stefan was talking about the different transport protocols. So the way the universal transport protocol works is specifically what it's trying to address is we have... The way interledger works is you have ledgers and you have connectors sitting in between them. And a connector is some party that has an account on both ledgers. And what you want to do is I want to send my money to a connector that shares a ledger with me, and I want them to pass it on. The, pro the immediate problem you run into when you're talking about that is what happens if they steal it or lose it? And so that was the first thing that, that we had to address with interledger, and that's what the universal mode in, in the white paper, it's called universal mode. Now we're calling it the universal transport protocol. So what that is all about is I don't actually want to just send the money to, let's say, Stefan is the connector. And he may be trustworthy, maybe not, but there's, there's some other people behind him as well. And so I really only, I want one of two things. I either want a guarantee that, I want a guarantee that either I will get a signed receipt from my final recipient saying, yep, I got the money, or I want my money back. 
And so that's the guarantee that the universal transport protocol has is that either you have uh, your money, you either you keep your money or you get a signed receipt. And so the way that works briefly is basically with escrow, where instead of sending the money directly to Stefan because he might run away with it or steal it, what I'm going to do is put it in escrow on my ledger. And so with Bitcoin, you'd use hash, hash time lock. Um, with other things, you could use a, a dedicated sort of escrow thing. But the key point is that the ledger itself is providing the escrow. So I, I put my money in escrow, and it only comes out if Stefan can deliver me that cryptographically signed receipt from the recipient. Um, and so we set up this chain of escrows. And so everybody's putting money in escrow all the way down the chain. Then the recipient sees, oh, there's money in escrow for me, just pending my signing this receipt. They sign the receipt, and that trickles back all the way along the chain. Okay, so I think in, in one of your talks, you describe it as uh, the escrow goes from, so if you have like payments going from left to right, the escrow comes back right to left. Uh, can, can you perhaps uh, give some more detail as to how, like how the connectors um, are sending money back and forth in the escrow, like in a transaction? And by the way, so what, what, it, there, for people who, who are listening who want to get a better sort of visual understanding of what this looks like, you can go to slideshow.net slash interledger and there's some slides there. And I'll put the link in the show notes as well um, that sort of illustrate what this looks like. Yeah, I, I would say that, you know, it, it, you can dive as deep as you want. If you really want to get the, 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 the defense and the, really ex the explanation of this protocol, um, I would refer you to the white paper, which is on interledger.org. Um, but I'll try to give sort of a very high-level description based on what, what Evans already said. Um, so if I'm a connector and, and kind of keeping with that same example, everyone wants to send money, I'm the first connector, um, I don't just want to put money on, on into escrow on some other ledger until I know that Evans actually committed to this payment. So I'm waiting for him to put money in escrow first. And that's that's why the money, the, the escrow is kind of going from left to right. Um, and then the execution, well, the recipient is the one who generates that receipt. So clearly the, the receipt has to come back from right to left. Um, and so that's why you kind of see that like left to right uh, preparation, right to left execution. Right. So Stefan as the connector doesn't trust me as the sender. So he's not going to do anything I ask until he sees money. But the thing he does trust is there's some ledger that's shared between us. Let's say that's the Bitcoin ledger. And so he trusts the Bitcoin ledger. I trust the Bitcoin ledger. If he sees that there's a transfer set up for, with money on the Bitcoin ledger for him, and that could be, yeah, we can get into exactly how that would work, but um, that there's, there's money sitting there that's committed to this specific transaction, then he's like, okay, I don't trust Evan, but I do trust Bitcoin. And so I'm going to take that and I'm going to go and set up a, transfer, a corresponding transfer on a later ledger. Mm -hmm. um, so, and what I'm interested in as the connector is that um, the two conditions are the same. Because again, I trust the two ledgers on either side of me. Um, and so if the two conditions are exactly the same, I know that whenever the right-hand side transfer is going to be fulfilled, I can take that fulfillment, that signature, and pass it onto the left-hand side ledger, and it'll be valid there as well. Um, so in many ways, it's very similar to sort of the hash lock concept in, in Lightning, if you're familiar with that. And one should probably add that this is actually a really brilliant cryptographic little neat little trick, right? Because it allows you to do these things in a, in a trustless way, even though those ledgers may be very different. Um, and it's, it's sort of, you know, simple works universally and it's not, it's not very intuitive, right? It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. I think if one just sort of explains why this will work. So I think to, to kind of really understand it, one, one needs to like sort of really walk through it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what, you just mentioned the, the trustless point, and one way to look at this is if Bitcoin and all of these cryptocurrencies have brought a way so that you can make an individual ledger trustless, what what Interledger does is make it so that you can tr you don't have to trust a connector that's some party that's relaying money between different ledgers. Right. Okay. So as long as you're yeah, we, you, because because you're within that payment network, if that payment network provides an escrow, then you trust the payment network not exactly. the connector okay um so coming back on this idea of connectors uh you know you've compared them to relay nodes uh on on the internet protocol uh 
what, what would they be analogous to? Would they be analogous to an ISP or like uh, an organization like Level 3? How can we compare connectors to existing internet infrastructure you know, participants? So there's one role in the internet protocol that's a very, very close analog. And that role used to be called the gateway. Today, we most, we most usually call it the, the router. Um, and it's basically a, a system which is on two networks. It's, it's usually a, a lower level network, a higher level network, or um, on the tier one level, it's sort of um, connecting two, two ISPs networks together. Um, and it basically knows how to um, take a packet that's coming in on one network and uh, figure out which of the other networks that it's connected to uh, to, to forward it on. Um, and so the, the gateways and the routers are responsible for the routing. And one thing that's really powerful about that is that it means that the sender and the receiver are not responsible for the routing. It means that the ledgers, are the, the networks themselves, are not responsible for the routing. And that keeps them all very simple. And so the, the complexity um, within the internet protocols is very much sort of concentrated in the routers. And um, even there, like it's concentrated in the largest routers, the routers that are actually used at the tier one providers. And so um, your home router can also be pretty simple. Um, and what that does is it means that the only people who have to upgrade the protocol regularly for it to work well are people who are going to have companies, they're going to be very invested in it, they're going to be competing with each other to be on the latest version. And so um, it tends to be a, a thing that, that gets upgraded very easily. Um, and so you can have your, your laptop, you can have your phone stay pretty much the same and still benefit from these improvements. So you would compare it to sort of the tier one internet uh routing like companies that do routing like i don't know like companies that do like level three for example I don't, i'm not i don't really remember all the names of the companies but so so they're not uh, the only ones who do routing right like they do routing on a large scale but then you yeah. have a home router and you do routing on a small scale um and you could make sort of a mesh router and, and do routing in a different way um that's really all uh, uh, all up to you you can create your own routing protocol if you want um but um, I think most of the complexity is concentrated among those larger companies. Oh, I see. Okay, so you could have, uh, for instance, um, some lower-level connectors that maybe do, like, connecting SEPA to PayPal, and then you may have some smaller connectors that are you know, connecting some obscure cryptocurrency to some other obscure cryptocurrency. at some, And so you have different levels there, and depending on how big the network is, that you're trying to send payments to, you may stay on that lower level network where there's a lot of traffic and a lot of volume. But you know, if you want to get into something like some little payment service provider in China, for example, then you may have to go through some smaller um, connector router and find a route to it. Exactly. Yeah, so the connectors are like routers. And just like there's various degrees of routers and various complexities, same, same thing we expect to see with the connectors. So what kind of companies are going to be running this? Like, will we see companies like Google in the end running those big, the big, more complex routing things or ISPs? Or will this be a more of a financial service thing where banks will do that? Or is it more like in Bitcoin where you sort of independent entities that uh, maybe be anonymous in some location? Like, what's, the, what's that going to look like? It's it's kind of funny because it's kind of like uh, the first person who discovers gold in California trying to imagine like who's going to be rich off of this. Well, whoever is there first, you know, like whoever um, can capitalize on that opportunity the quickest. So it could be banks because they already have some of the regulatory and um, compliance sort of background to do this, but they're kind of more slow moving. So maybe it's um, more like payments companies like Venmo, Square, uh, Google, Apple. Um, those guys, it could be Bitcoin startups, it could be that Bitcoin exchanges are just the only ones that adopt a protocol like this. And so they just grow to be, um, you know, very large network providers. Um, whoever it is, um, we think it's a huge opportunity. And so it's just a matter of like, who's going to be there first. And speaking of exchanges, you know, if, if at some point Interledger becomes like as big as the internet and like everybody's using Interledger, all payment platforms and payment service providers have integrated all the conditions to be fully supported and we just have this network of payments um, between different types of ledgers what does that mean for you know things like exchanges that traditionally have served that role or even the stock market like if if I can just 
send money to myself from one payment network to another, then doesn't that whole infrastructure of, you know, third party exchanges sort of crumble? Um, so I think that that exchanges are essentially connectors, right? They they um, are connected to more than one ledger. So it could be a Bitcoin ledger and SEPA. Um, and they provide liquidity between those two ledgers and, and their customers provide liquidity between those two ledgers. And so one of the uh, primary models that we see that connectors could work is by being exchanges, by having people trading um, and then using some of that liquidity to, to facilitate payments. So what would be different then in a world where those exchanges are talking to their customers through interledger rather than what we have now? So if you just want to compare exchanges today with with how connectors work in interledgers, primarily I think the difference would be the degree of automation. And so if I want to use an exchange today, I actually need to go on one network and like manually type in a bunch of things in order to send a payment to them. And they may have maybe have custom instructions to say, you know, include this transaction ID or send to this Bitcoin address or something like that. They have custom instructions to be able to correlate an incoming transfer from me to them. But I need to go and, and actually type that in myself. And then they will go and they'll have some process for doing that on the other ledger. What Interledger does is standardizes that way of doing it so that you can automate more of this. So that you could even see it as like a standardized protocol between exchanges so that I can talk to each of my exchanges on different networks in the same way, which just makes it a lot easier to route a lot more payments through them. And so one one way you could see it is that uh, exchanges would need to be very competitive because they could, uh, having a standardized protocol in some ways makes them more interchangeable. But what the way I would look at it is that you also make it a lot more useful because if I could, you know, if I can pay with Bitcoin really for anything and not just to people who accept Bitcoin, then I'm purely competing. Then Bitcoin is purely competing on the strength of it as a itself as a ledger, um, as opposed to needing to go and get all the network effects of getting lots of people to accept it and and use it for everything. And so you could have exchanges and ledgers be both more competitive, but also be used for a lot more because it if you can automate things, it makes it a lot easier to route payments. I want to stay on that point really quick because it's an extremely important point. Like you think of the internet as this extremely frictionless system that you know you don't really have to worry about it. Like I don't worry which which path my uh, messages take because it pretty much works. And one of the reasons for that isn't necessarily um, that it, it, it the protocols are so amazing or, or so special, but because of the competitive environment that the internet creates. If I'm a network that drops a bunch of packets all the time, people are not going to want to peer with me and it'll automatically find the routes that are the best. Um, and so for compared to the financial network, like today, if I want to get money from Bitcoin to Litecoin um, and, and someone wants to provide that service, they have to actually have a brand. I have to kind of trust them a little bit um, and I have to figure out that they exist. I have to find them. So you have to do marketing, branding, and all these things. Um, and so there are companies out there already that are connectors, this shape of connecting different cryptocurrencies. There's companies that are connecting, let's say, PayPal to M-Pesa and, and you can use them. Um, so they are out there, but they have to to have all this overhead of being like branded and um, having customer service and all that kind of stuff. Whereas really, it should be um, automated and it should be something that um, that is just uh, competitive. So if I can offer a better rate, I should be able to just put that in the system and have traffic go through me immediately. Right. But so before you mentioned that this was a big opportunity to become such a connector. I mean, if there's no uh brand involved really if it's a, so isn't this just kind of a, like a race to bottom and it will be done at cost or why do you think there's such an opportunity here so there are in the internet again speaking speaking from that model um if you are the best connector you will grow and once you have economies of scale you will be permanently cheaper than than your competitors so um i mean you, it's not the kind of opportunity like being a correspondent bank today where you literally can you know, uh, have a cost basis of, of one or two basis points and charge people 20. Um, I don't think that'll be like that because there's too much competition for that. Uh, but you can definitely uh, capture the margin of, of um, the economies of scale. And so if you get to be very large, you can make a lot of money with that. The, the other thing I really want to highlight, though, is if you compare this to the development of the internet and looked at just this, the scope, the scale of 
how many, for example, payments are being sent today, we very much expect that the volume of payments sent will explode in the similar way to how much information is being sent exploded on the internet. Because if you can dramatically reduce the cost of sending an individual message to the point where you don't really think about it, and then if you have that interoperability so that you also don't have to think about, like if I want to send you money today, we have this whole negotiation about, you know, do you have the same, you have PayPal? No, you don't have PayPal. Do you accept Bitcoin? No, you don't accept Bitcoin. Then, no. And like we have this whole manual negotiation, which just means we don't use, we don't use it a lot. I think the statistic is like people in the U.S. send 2.1 payments per day. I have no idea how many packets I'm uh, I'm sending across the internet today because I don't care. It it doesn't it you know I'm I'm thinking on a different scale. I'm thinking about my cell phone's data plan, which is like huge Big numbers device. of packets. And so we Billions. fully expect that to happen with payments as well. Because if you can automate all of this and then stop thinking about it, where you know I'm just going to build payments into this other thing that I'm doing, where you never would have thought of doing that before because you have to do signups, you have to do all of this kind of overhead. It wouldn't be worth it to build payments into all of, all of these things. But if you get that interoperability right, then you can build payments into a lot more stuff. So we fully expect the, the volume to just explode with, with something like this. Yeah, absolutely. I totally see that. So, so you mentioned economies of scale regarding connectors. Is there some kind of centralization risk here that you would say, like, well, that gives undue power to those entities if they become massive? Yeah, so, I mean, we obviously get that question a lot. And so having been in the quote unquote decentralization industry for almost yeah six years now, um, it, it, it's given me a lot of time to think about that. And um, thinking back and, at, at what decentralization, decentralization really means is it means that you have the choice, you have the ability to um, go with whatever provider gives you the best option. It's almost like more about competitiveness than it, than it is about what the actual physical topology is. So. Um, think about something like uh, something like Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin isn't centralized just because um, there is a there's one network. Bitcoin is is um, a decentralized network underneath, and so the reason for that is because anyone can become a miner. And so for something like Interledger, if anyone can become a connector, then even if the connector is very large, it doesn't mean that they have this power over you. It's not like Facebook, where if I if I leave, all my my contacts are gone, right? If I switch to a different connector, I just get the new rate and that's it. And so if anyone out there can offer a better rate, they can become the new new big connector. Um, that really puts uh, a check on, on even a monopolist. Like you can have, it, it, in competition, it really doesn't matter how many players you have, only how hard it would, become, would be for someone else to enter the market and undercut them. Um, it's actually a good thing if you have um, some very large players that are able to take advantage of economies of scale, just as long as... Um, they don't become able to keep other people out of the market. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Are there some other attack vectors? Like, could could they abuse connectors, abuse abuse their position in some other way, and potentially, you know, steal money from people? Um, I mean, so the, the protocol kind of keeps uh, keeps you safe from from the connector pretty much. Like uh, as we mentioned, there's escrow. Uh, connector can't really steal anything. Um, there's certainly the ability for people to DOS each other. Um, one of the things that's actually kind of interesting about Interledger is that um, it's both a, a way to send payments, but we also can use Interledger to prevent DOS attacks against Interledger, right? You can actually make um, certain requests that are expensive to process cost something. Um, and so uh, that's, that's, that's true for any kind of distributed system that you can use incentives to solve a lot of these type of attack vectors. So, um, I mean... I can't predict the future, but certainly if I play it out in my head, I can't think of any way that um, a very large connector would be able to just outright um, disable the competition because it is just a protocol, because I can set up a path however I want. So as, as soon as someone misbehaves um, to a certain extent, it'll be worth it for people to to make sure they route around them. I want to just highlight one, that point that, that you made, because I think it's a really cool one that... Um, for when you talk about denial of service attacks today, there's a lot of different ways that people address denial of service attacks. But fundamentally, where the problem arguably comes from is that when you make a request to a server, you're asking it to do some work for you, but you're not giving it anything in exchange. And so the servers have to try really hard to figure out who's doing it legitimately and who's not. But with if you could just send these little tiny payments, and this gets back to 
what I was saying about I think the the volume of payments will explode is like if you just made some very very tiny payment to every server that you talk to in the world it would be a completely negligible cost to you but that would completely cut out denial of service attacks not only in so we can we can talk about that in a general sense. So if I'm operating some service, an API service, I could use Interledger along with that to cut down on denial of service. What Stefan was saying is that we can also use that very feature within Interledger to cut down on denial of service attacks against Interledger itself because after all, the connectors and things are just ser are just internet internet services that are similar to, to other ones. And just, just to add to that, and sorry, we're going on for a long time, but it's, it's, a, it's something that's very exciting for us, is a lot of distributed systems yeah. have these incentive problems. And so uh, a lot of the people who come to us uh, looking for uh, solutions are people who are working on mesh networks, on um, you know, distributed file systems, and that kind of stuff, where they're trying to figure out how to um, you know, pay for the utility people add to the system in a decentralized way. And I think Interledger is, is a great solution for, for those types of protocols. And so I'm excited about what Interledger can do for the decentralized future, where you know I've almost gotten a little bit um, I know, disillusioned with this idea of like, okay, we're gonna have this like decentralized ledger, really huge ledger, but there's still gonna be some people who kind of control that, they're kind of setting the rules, they're kind of defining the protocol. Uh, but Interledger really lets you get away from that. And so it allows you to build decentralized systems that are I guess more decentralized or decentralized in a more real sense, right? Because there's no, not even a group of developers that kind of controls the whole thing. Yeah, it's decentralized. Uh, it, it's, it's. I wouldn't call it decentralized, but I would call it um, distributed and having more uh, freedom to choose. I guess. Uh, whereas with something like Bitcoin, you're sort of stuck with one system. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, e economic incentives, uh, you know, coming to sort of, you know, this is, this is very interesting and, you know, theoretically it's, it's, it's very cool. And, 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 but if, uh, if, you know, it's somewhere down the line, we expect companies to start using interledger and making their ledgers cryptographically, um, uh, so, so inter in integrated cryptographic escrow into their services. Uh, what is the incentive for a company like PayPal, where you know their their interest is to have as many users as possible and to be using their service? If you're creating really easy avenues for interoperability and for in perhaps you know using other services that might be better, what is the incentive there to uh, to cut you know for 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 payment companies to come around this protocol? Yeah, so, so that's actually kind of an interesting question that, that I was struggling with as well. And, and I kind of looked at the history of the internet for some inspiration. And um, when you think about the history of, of especially the web, where um, you kind of had this transition from the days of the online service providers, the online services networks, where you had AOL, you had CompuServe, Genie, uh, which were all sort of con closed networks. And they were competing on um, the number of services that were on each network, just like PayPal is competing on the number of users and merchants that are on their on their ledger. And so what happened was that um, some of the smaller guys, not necessarily the number one, number two, but maybe the number three, four, and five, um, saw the interoperability that the web provided as a way to expand the services that they could offer, a way to expand the content that you could get through their network. And so that gives them a way to compete with some of the larger ones on, on the reach. And then eventually it gets to a point where this um, sort of open protocol has enough content on it that if you're not on it, it's a pretty major omission. And so if you're one of the largest guys, you start getting that request from your customers saying like, why aren't you on that? I, I you know, like this is the biggest um, set of content out there. Why can't I access that through AOL? That's crazy. And so AOL, the way that they responded to that was they eventually added that support. And um, they thought about it as, well, we're going to connect to that, but we're still going to have all the extra AOL services. And people are going to value those extra AOL services, and so they are going to stay on AOL. Um, but what happened long term was, was um, the internet just became like one global market. And so the, the most successful companies were the ones that um, stopped worrying about the size of their network and stopped worrying about the added value that they could provide, and rather just try to be as efficient as possible and try to provide the best customer access to, this, um, to the internet itself. That's really interesting. I, I love these internet analogies with uh, with Interledger because I think they're the, they they really tie into you know, how how networks develop. Um, so tell us what where's the 
you know, where's the project at right now? What have you accomplished? Uh, maybe talk about some of the uh, efforts going on with the W3C to try to bring this to some sort of standard level. Sure. So um, we came out with the white paper last October. Um, so that's available on interledger.org. That's kind of the technical defense of it. Uh, we've been working on putting out more documentation, things like that. We have the, there's an open source reference implementation that's under heavy development that you can find that on GitHub, github.com slash interledger. Um, and then a lot of the develop, the kind of core development is going on. There's at the, the W3C is the web, is one of the web standards organizations. And we have a, a community group there that's focused on interledger. And so that's where a lot of the discussions and technical development is happening. So you can, if you're interested in tracking the progress, you can find us on, uh, we have on interledger.org, it says a bunch of different ways you can find us. There's mail, a mailing list, IRC, things like that. Uh, but the, the main avenue is to join the community group. That's where a lot of the development is happening. And uh, what, what kind of remains to be done? Like what, where do you see interledger at a year from now, two, year for, two years from now? Like how long do you think this adoption is gonna take and, and how does it have to happen? So I would say the, the first thing, the most low level thing that we had to achieve uh, was the uh, create a specification for uh, how ledgers express and validate the escrow. Um, the reason why that's the most fundamental thing um, is because all the ledgers have to uh, validate the escrow in the same way. If we're going back to that example where I'm a connector, if the ledger on the left of me, let's say Bitcoin, the ledger on the right of me uh, validate different types of, of cryptographic conditions, of, of escrow conditions, um, then I can't I can't facilitate a payment between them, and so it's really key um, that those cryptographic conditions are uh, standardized. Now, um, obviously, there are cryptographic standards already. So, for example, uh, Bitcoin already implements SHA-256. So, one thing that we did was just sort of um, adopt some of the standards that are already most widely used, so that as many existing ledgers as possible, including Bitcoin, most other cryptocurrencies, um, and Ripple, of course. Um, all already support Interledger as is, without any changes. Um, the next thing, uh, though, was to sort of plan for the future. And we wanted, for example, to have uh, distributed systems, decentralized systems, be able to um, sign things that then trigger Interledger payments. And so for that, we needed the ability to express signatures uh, with multiple signers, a standard multi-sig. Um, and so we kind of came up with a spec for that. So that's the first part. Um, the second part was uh, to work on um, uh, routing. And so the crypto conditions being pretty much final, I think that we're still looking for input, of course, um, but I, we have a working uh, spec for that. The second part being um, uh, routing. So we need to figure out how do the routing tables at the connectors actually get populated. And so that's the thing that we're most actively working on right now. We just added it to a reference implementation, the way that we think it should work initially. Um, Obviously, there's going to be something. There's going to be a lot of innovation over decades, I think, on this. Um, but uh, we have a working sort of model right now, um, and so you can take the reference implementation today and make payments that use these crypto conditions and that use uh, that routing. Um, and so the next part for us is kind of to make a lot more uh, easy interfaces and and kind of clients and other things that make it easy for people to use the system, um, as well as uh, make it easier to run sort of scalable ledgers, scalable connectors, and so on. Uh, we might do a lot of optimization, kind of trying to make it faster, um, trying to reduce the, the latency of payments. Um, but really, the, the two key pieces were the crypto conditions and the routing. We're just getting to a point now where both of those are um, starting to stabilize a little bit. Yeah, and so the, the point that it's at is that if, if people are interested in trying it out, you can go and, and look at the code, you can download it. We have a, There's a demo that, that kind of show, shows off a lot of this functionality. That's all working and, and there. There are some of the internal details that are still being worked on, but as Stefan was explaining before, one of the goals with this project is to make it so that the interface to using Interledger can stay the same and the internals of it can keep getting better and better over time. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for developers who, I kind of think of it as there's two classes of, of developers that might be interested in this. One may be really interested in the technical details and understanding the routing protocols and everything about how this works internally. And so for that kind of person, I would say to get involved in the community group, to um, read the white paper, look at some of the, the routing docs that are going to be coming out shortly, and really dive into that and definitely looking for people who are interested in that. 
I would say there's another group of people who don't care how all of this works internally. They just basically just want to use payments in their other thing that they're building. And so for that audience, we're trying to have really good documentation and very simple interfaces to use this so that you don't have to understand all of the details of how this works. Similar to how I don't understand all of the details about how the internet works, but I can still use it. And even if the internet protocols or, in, or the routing protocols and whatnot are being constantly upgraded, I'm still, I still just have basically the same interface to use, use the internet. So just to boil that all down for someone who's watching and kind of thinking about, okay, how do I get involved in this? The best thing right now is to go to interledger.org and go to the W3C community group and join that and sort of start participating on the mailing list and the IRC channel. Um, and then we are very aware that our website is severely lacking right now, so we are working on a better one uh, that kind of brings all the different documentation that we have and all different specs and everything into one place. Right now that stuff is kind of all spread all over the place, so um, expect a better website in the, in the next couple of weeks, um, uh, next couple of months. Today's magic word is BELLS, B-E-L-L-S. Head over to letstalkbitcoin.com to sign in, enter the magic word, and claim your part of the listener award. So just one last question on, on this thing here, like, what is the adoption? Is there any adoption happening in terms of like businesses or, or banks or, or maybe payments companies or like working with you guys on integrating that? Or, or do you have plans on sort of actively uh, trying to get this adopted? Yeah, so right now, um, what we're mostly interested in is like people can help us figure out the technology, right? So individual developers, individual contributors um, who either have some background with uh, designing protocols or simply just have the free time to dedicate to a project like this, which is already, you know, a lot of people aren't that lucky, you know? So um, I think the, the right now what we have is like a, a number of contributors, uh, some coming more from a community background. So for example, there's uh, as somebody who, who's been working on uh, mesh networks and sort of looking at Interledger for that. Um, there's someone who works for, for a well-known payment startup, and he's kind of providing um, uh, some input on the protocol. He's worked on, I think, TLS before, so he has some background in that, in that space on cryptography and so on. Um, there's uh, um, a scribe, the, the guys behind BigchainDB, um, who've been very, very uh, involved in kind of helping us every step of the way. Um, they have one of the most scalable ledgers, and so they have an interest in interoperability because you know, it's going to make their ledger look really good compared to all the other ones. Um, you know, it, whoever has the best ledgers has the most interest in interoperability, I think. Um, and so, yeah, there have been some early contributors. Um, we're definitely eager to grow that um, now that, that we've had a little bit more to show. It's always a little bit hard to, you know, advertise too much when, when you're still just writing the initial specs and still just writing the initial stuff down. Um, but, yeah, we're at the point where, where we're hoping that more people will get interested. So briefly before we talk about Ripple and, and wrap up, so Evan, you brought up the, the use case of micropayments. You mentioned it a few times. Like, why is that such a good fit with Interledger? And, and like, why is that going to be so important? Yeah, so um, right now there's a lot, a lot of different people are talking about micropayments. And one, one of the, I think the drawbacks with a lot of the, it, a lot of the non-interledger solutions for micropayments is that in the same way with regular payments, if you tie it to, for example, one currency or one ledger, you have the limitation of you need to get everybody to use your one ledger. And we've already talked about the reasons why we think it's more powerful if you have interoperability between these and it's, it's more interchangeable. And so when talking about micropayment use cases, if you had a system that had all of the benefits that people talk about of micropayments, but let, made it so that I can accept dollars and you can pay with bitcoins or whatever combination of those things, that's much more powerful than having to go and sign up for a, thing, a different thing than what you already have. So that's one of the reasons I think it's a really good use case for it, as well as um, because interledger, because there's no network and there's no scalability problems to interledger because it's it's not a thing in and of itself it's just a protocol between different networks you could use interledger for an unlimited number of micropayments which was one of the big big issues to address with micropayments and obviously you need the ledgers to support that but if you have say dedicated micropayment ledgers that are really really scalable and can can handle that kind of volume then it becomes a non-issue to send lots and lots of micropayments through 
Yeah, and I actually I add one more thing to that, which is a lot of people talk about including micropayments in other standards. And so that's everything from talking about HTTP micropayments to a project that I've been working on recently is trying to include micropayments in torrents. And what I would say is that um, if your micropayment solution is tied to one specific currency or one specific ledger, you're going to run into a problem because you run into that same issue of you come and say, oh, I have the, you know, the best micropayment solution and you have to use PayPal. And then someone else is like, no, 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 I have the best micropayment solution, and, but you have to use Bitcoin. And everybody will, you'll end up with lots of different systems like that. Again, you have no interoperability between them and you're kind of sunk because the way that standards work is that you, in order to build something like payments into other standards, whether it's BitTorrent or HTTP or other things, it has to be truly neutral where there's no party that gains from using that. And so you can't tie it to a specific thing. And so I think it's much more powerful if you're interested in micropayments to think about what you could do with something like Interledger where you can express payments in a generic way that can use any underlying ledger to, to carry them out. So that's why we talk about micropayments. So you guys are doing all this work on Interledger you know, as, as part of your job at Ripple. Why is Ripple investing so much in this? And why is this such an important project for Ripple? Or Ripple Labs, I should. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, so Ripple, um, we are now 125 people. Um, uh, about uh, four or five of those are, are working on Interledger. And um, just to put things in perspective, and, and the reason we do that is because uh, Interledger is used in Ripple's own product. It's kind of like how um, you know, a company uh, that, that's using a database internally might open source that database um, the way that we've open sourced Ripple D. You know, it's kind of something that um, is very foundational, and we build a lot of um, you know, value add and proprietary stuff on top of that. Um, but we with interoperability, it's kind of a pointless to keep that in-house. You know, like what's the point of having HTTP if you're going to make it closed source? Um, so for us, it's it's just a way of, of uh, open, source, open sourcing that protocol. And also, um, it helps us a little bit in terms of, um, you know, why should banks upgrade? Why should banks upgrade their infrastructure? And uh, a lot of, especially the largest banks, are pretty comfortable right now because um, the system sucks for their customers, but their customers have no other alternative. And so the way that I described earlier, um, you know, Intelligent makes it so that if someone has a better path that, that even goes around some of the big hubs of liquidity and is a little bit cheaper, Intelligent will be able to take advantage of those paths. So it basically gives the smaller players a way to um, make their systems more interoperable and therefore make themselves more efficient um, as an alternative to some of the big hubs that are out there. And that, of course, makes the big hubs want to upgrade, and that's where, where Ripple provides products. And so um, it also creates a little bit more demand for, for, our, for our solutions. I'll also add that in, in general, Ripple's vision has always been talking about this internet of value concept where it's as easy to move money as information and connecting lots of different currencies. And previously, the, the setup has been focused on the Ripple consensus ledger, but you know we've discussed endlessly now the problems with trying to attract everyone to one ledger. And so the, the vision of Ripple from the beginning was to create this internet of value and we think this is a really good way of doing this, as well as there's also lots of interesting use cases outside of the ones that Ripple as a company are, are interested in that are more focused on bank, banks using this. So we want to get lots of other people who have other use cases that they're interested in to use this as well. Um, I want to quickly mention something since you brought up the Ripple consensus ledger, and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that, that sort of have question, like what, what becomes of that? What's the future of, of Ripple Consensus Ledger? What's the future of XRP? Um, so we think that, that, uh, that Ripple Consensus Ledger is going to continue to be the, the root ledger for XRP. And um, we believe that XRP will be an attractive currency that to use as a bridge currency. So whenever you're going through um, a multi-currency transaction, a, a currency exchange, um, because it's very inefficient to create markets between all possible pairs, there tend to be bridge currencies that emerge. And so Ripple, you know, will try our best to to position XRP as um, as a bridge currency, um, not the only one, of course, but um, as one of the the better ones. And so from our perspective, it's always been something that um, you know people know about Bitcoin, so they use Bitcoin. And so it's been frustrating for us having you know let's say uh, you know higher transaction processing or lower latency and so on, and not having it be used because 
um, uh, people weren't uh, weren't aware of it or weren't um, uh, using it. And so Interledger, hoping we're hoping that it actually creates a, a bigger market for XRP because um, you know it, if it's the cheapest, if it's the fastest, which we believe it is, um, it'll have uh, a, an advantage over um, over other systems that are slower. So you mean because once you have Interledger widely adopted. Uh, if I want to send US dollars to uh, your account, I'll have to hop through something. And then you think because Ripple is going to, it's going to be easy to route through anything, then Ripple's ledger and XRP might become one of those routing stations where the actual currency exchange takes place. Yeah. So I said earlier that it was very attractive to, um, you know, try to scale up your ledger and try to, uh, become a, a very efficient hub for liquidity, and so um, we certainly want to play that game. We certainly want to compete for that for that uh, revenue. So uh, whether we'll be successful, I don't know. There's nothing. Just to be totally clear, put all the conspiracy theories to rest. Like there's nothing in Intelligent that would particularly advantage XRP, um, but we are uh, we are thinking that it is the best ledger out there right now. It's the best uh, decentralized ledger, and so as that, it should it should do really well in the system. Okay, cool. Well, uh, thanks so much, guys. Thanks for coming on. And uh, it will be very exciting, I think, to see how Interledger progresses and how it's going to be adopted, how companies are going to use it, and uh, what the reception will be. Thank thanks you. for having us. Uh, and yeah, of course, we will have links to, to the white paper, to some of the presentations they've done, uh, to the working group, and all of those in the show notes. So listeners who want to dive deeper or get involved, uh, you know, you'll know where to go. Um, so we, we're part of the LTB network. There's lots of shows uh, you can find on letsofbitcoin.com. And we put out new episodes every Monday. You can subscribe to it on your favorite podcast app or watch the videos on youtube.com slash epicenterbitcoin. And uh, well, thanks so much. And we look forward to seeing you next week.